it's lunchtime, and this is our first ever lunchtime broadcast. Uh, we're coming to you, both of us today, from Winnipeg, Manitoba, here in Canada. And this broadcast is going to be a little bit different because it's not in the format of the prophets discussing things. It's just heart to hearts getting to know one another, me talking to, to people that you may or may not have met yet and uh, who I would love for you to get to know. And I love to hear people's stories and their prophetic journey, their spiritual journey, what they're doing in life, how they are bringing themselves to the table, how they're using what God has gifted them, because we're not all the same, are we? And thank goodness for that. God has wired us so very, very differently. So, Kevin, I'll tell you, sorry, I'll tell you about our guest in a few minutes. But first of all, Kevin, you were first on today in the Highlands in Scotland. And I see you, Sharon, in the UK. There's Lorna, there's Maria in the Philippines, Angie in the United States, hello, Anne-Marie in Cardiff in Wales, and Jim in Oklahoma. It's really, really good to see you, and Sandy in BC. Today, my guest is a, a gal named Heidi Corte, and I've known Heidi for a number of years, um, quite a few actually, and uh, Heidi is a music teacher here in Manitoba. In fact, she teaches all of my grandchildren music, so she has a very special place in my heart, and I love the way that she teaches and gets to know her kids and, and how she loves them and they love her. Miss Heidi, that's what they all call her, Miss Heidi. So Heidi, welcome this morning to, or is it afternoon? I guess it's technically afternoon. Yep. Thank so, you. Good yeah. to be here. I would love for you to say a little bit about yourself. You know, I can introduce you and say you're a music teacher, you love Jesus, all of that kind of thing. But, you know, you give us a little bit about yourself that that you would like to say this is who I am sure um I was raised in a really traditional actually we were raised in the same um environment pretty much you and I um I was in a really traditional environment for about 20 years um and then I moved to Winnipeg I think God moved me to Winnipeg and I had actually abandoned Christianity at that point um, because in the denomination that I was brought up in, women weren't allowed to do things and or pray and or lead. And I knew that I was born to lead. Um, and so around the age of 18, 20, I abandoned, um, abandoned faith altogether. And then God put me in Winnipeg and said, I don't think so. And I met people for the first time who heard from God on a regular basis. And I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> and I remember being so offended because I had studied the Bible my whole life that I almost felt like I could speak for God on his behalf because I had read the book. And then uh, kind of like like uh, like someone famous, if you read all their material and all, all their autobiographies, you can kind of feel like you know them. Oh, there's my cat. Um, but But it's not the same as sitting down, like having coffee with someone, then you really get to know them. And so I would say that in my twenties coming to Winnipeg, that's what um, God did was allowed me to see that he, I could actually sit down and, and, and commune with him and hear back from him. So that was just life changing. Well, how did that happen? Like, did you crash into Christians or, or like what happened? Like the moment where we're yeah. sort of, well, actually I was in my dorm and uh, the only other Christian and I hadn't gone to church at least in a couple of years. The only other Christian um, just <laughs> arrested me and said, we're going to church. And he <laughs> took me to this EMC church that was in a school gym. So like my religious upbringing was immediately so offended. I'm like, this is not church. It's a gym. You cannot have church in a gym. Like I was so, I remember being so offended even when the worship leader said, you know, uh, let's kneel for the last chorus. I was like, where is that in the Bible? But <laughs> hello, it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really funny to think about now. So oh, that's that's how I got connected there. And then from there, um, sort of moved into the charismatic environment. So where I met you. you. Is that where you met me in, in those years that you were just coming out of, of uh, this? I, think I, so. met, I, I think I met you at 
beyond this, oh, this yeah. inner city gathering we had in Winnipeg and yeah. it was very like Holy Spirit led and yeah. frightening for someone like me. I was yeah. like, I would see people <laughs> manifest something in the Holy Spirit. I'd be like, dear God, please don't ever let that happen to me. I don't want to be that person. <laughs> wow. Okay. So Heidi, um, you and I, like you just said, we came from very traditional background, the same same denomination, you know, very traditional. How did you find, was it a long journey to break free from some of the things that, that actually held you captive kind of thing? Or was it all of a sudden the light went on? Well, you were actually, do you, I don't know if you remember, you were actually instrumental in one of the big breakthroughs um, in my life. Do you remember? No. Nope. Uh, it was when we were at the cabin. Oh, five, uh, you, uh, you and another amazing mentor invited, uh, me and four other really on fire for the Lord oh, yes, friends anytime. out to, um, out to a cabin for the weekend. So it was just such an honor to, you know, um, visit with the prophets for the weekend and, you know, to be one of, that was chosen to go was just, I was so excited. And yeah, I, I feel like each of us experienced some element of deliverance that weekend. We each had a moment. It was like, oh, well now it's this girl's moment to get delivered. And I think that weekend I had a dream that you were, you were with me in my basement, helping me rummage through things and pack and unpack and sort and you the next morning, and I did not know you at all, said, oh, I know what that means. This has to do with foundation. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it so clearly because it was such a, a moment in my life. And then I remember around the dinner table getting delivered of a spirit of religion. And, yeah. and it, was, it was like my whole world uh, changed the next day. You know, normally I would walk down the street and see a tattoo parlor and say, closed in Jesus name. Like, <laughs> actually. And I remember the day after the weekend walking down and going, oh, maybe I should get a tattoo. And I was like, wow, it's so interesting how my internal um, space changed instantly after that moment. Heather Clayton from who lives in North Wales and actually not far from the school that I used to go to of this denomination that we're talking about. She goes, me too, very traditional. As a child, I used to give marks out of 10 for the hats going past <laughs> when on my knees during communion. <laughs> yeah, there's more of us out there than I think we realize. And some of these roots that we take with us, you know, and, and try and understand the move of the spirit or try and understand how God talks to us. Some of these roots that are so deep just hold us back, you know, so it's a, it's a, a special, special day when Holy Spirit actually moves somehow to set you free. And it's different for everyone, isn't it? Like, that's incredible that you had a dream, you know, showing, cutting through all of your arguments, you were asleep. So you couldn't argue back at that moment. And yet you had a dream and you were brave enough to share it. And so God could actually do something. I think that's incredible. That's but a landmark moment for me. Yeah. So yeah, things really changed. I think even in my ability to share the love of God with people before I was like one of those people who was almost offensive with, it, it was more about being right um, than about actually loving people into the kingdom. And and um, it was actually probably pharisaical. Yeah, I would say very pharisaical um, and very separatist, us and them. Um, and then from that moment, it, it just changed. So yeah, to me, that's like a, a big moment in my journey. So how did you live that out with your family first? Um, in what way? Well, did you just sort of blurt out that you'd had this epiphany? Or yeah, did this? I did. <laughs> did you... And I offended them all. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I think... didn't stay like that. I think I was just so excited that I'd experienced some of these things and I wanted all my family to experience them. So I, I think right away I began pushing like, you know, do you know how to hear the voice of God for yourself? Well, let's sit down and try, you know, and, and have you been delivered of this? And, you know, I, I was just really excited. Um, now I think it's a little bit more balanced. <laughs> Yeah, as we as we grow in the things of God and the ways of God and the wisdom of God, usually it does have that effect <laughs> that we're not so out there and and you know doing and saying the things that we shouldn't that that just upset people. Oh my goodness. Not that we ever intend to to upset people. It just mm -hmm. happens, right? 
Yeah. So how did you begin to live this out then in your work environment? Because you're a music teacher, you, you're in business for yourself, you have a lot of clients. How does that look? Well, at the time, I was actually working at Starbucks in the um, middle of Winnipeg, and I had contact with 500 people a day. So that was sort of my life then. I hadn't really started teaching yet. Um, I think it just changed in the way I loved people who were really different uh, than me or um, whose views of sexuality were different than mine. Um, it just, it, it created a, a tie to them as opposed to a, a wall between me and them um, where I could just love them and see them for dearly beloved of God, right? As yeah. opposed to us and them and I'm better because I do these things and you're less because you do these things. And you know what I mean? It was like, actually, you're dearly beloved of God. You were a treasure. Like it just changed things. So it changed the way <laughs> every time someone would use <laughs> Jesus's name as a curse word, I stopped saying is my best friend. <laughs> Oh, how annoying was that? <laughs> that's like that other saying that's, that's, um, love the, what is it? Um, love the sinner, but hate the sin or something like that. You know, it's like one of those sayings that, what are you talking about? You know, love yeah. is love. Wow. So, um, how did your students, I think most of them were aware that you were a believer, right? A Christ follower. Yeah. I mean, What's fun about what I do now is um, like a lot of the freedom and liberty that I've experienced in church, um, I've found a way to translate it to a secular level and get to impart it to my students. So like things like um, like false beliefs about yourself, um, you know, that, if, yeah, like the example, if you believe something really negative about yourself, you live under it. I learned that in church. Um, but I've found ways of um, having that be part of my music lessons so that my students um, actually gain a tremendous, hopefully most of them gain a tremendous level of freedom. Wow. Well, I know they, I think they love you and they respond to whatever it is that you're carrying. And I think they've, you know, if I look back at the days when I was taking music, my teacher sat beside me with a ruler ready to oh, smash gosh. my hand. And, you know, so when I listen to the stories that my grandchildren tell me about um, the way you teach them, um, it's a completely different um, environment. You know, I actually had a dream. I met someone else who had a um, who had had a music teacher like this. This woman was probably in her um, 40s or 50s. Mm -hmm. And I had this dream. It was it was um, that I was in a secondhand store and I found a hammered dulcimer that was just covered in dust and it was out of tune. And I just saw it and knew that it was a, like a treasure to be found, like because I've always wanted a hammered dulcimer myself. Um, and and so I began in the dream dusting it off and just cleaning it up and 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 allowing it to shine again. And then what was funny was the next day I met a lady in a secondhand store. She was the owner of this store. Wow. And she had had um, a nun slam the she actually had um, scars on her knuckles from where um, the, this nun had slammed the uh, piano down on her fingers when she made mistakes. She and so she was deeply wounded and said, I love music, but it just like it, it um, any anything to do with music brings up these horrible memories and of like abuse. And so I went home after meeting her and I tried to encourage her. I even said that I'd give her a free couple lessons. And what was funny was on the way home, the Lord was like, she's the hammered dulcimer. And I was like, what? How cool is that? <laughs> it's amazing when we meet people like that and God's prepared us and, and given us stuff for them. And yeah, oh my goodness, Heidi. I think that, that um, well, I don't just think, I know that when students come into your environment that you carry a measure of healing for them. You know, it's not just music lessons there's no well i think as a musician in order to this is just like general statement i think as a musician in order to survive yeah you need to really have this sorted out like you need to be able to handle comparison right like how many how many musicians there's always going to be a musician better than you always yeah. so there are just things there's probably that's what my book is about actually um there's probably at least 20 things i can think of off the hop that you need to get a hold of here um even just authenticity, right? Like music is supposed to come from you. It's supposed to be a gift to people who listen. Yeah. And I grew up um, getting my identity from that. 
so I, I gained my importance for music and I, I actually did music to get, if that makes sense. Yeah. I understand. Um, and around 33, this is like a little rabbit trail, but all of a sudden the Lord placed this Jewish singer in my path who sang from her heart. And every time she sang, I was like so deeply moved. And it was just like getting hit on the head with like, I don't know, one of those things from Bugs Bunny, like just wham. It was like, I've been doing it wrong for 33 years. I've made it about me when it actually isn't about me. <laughs> wow. It's about giving away. Yeah. And out of that um, change in your life has come a book that you've written. Let's talk a little bit about that because it's important what God has had, the revelation he's given you about all of these things. And, and then we'll move on into talking a little bit about worship. But, okay. but you have been working on this book. It's done now. Um, well, it's, it's on its fourth edit. So okay. right now I have, pre, I have pre-readers that are reading and then, then I'm going to give it another edit and then we're going to start going through publishing. Okay, so there's a book about to get launched, about to be given birth to. Heidi, tell us about it. Oh, I am so excited. You know, I um, this book was prophesied by a friend of mine, Julie Meyer, who was one of my main influences in worship. Um, and she said three years ago, she had said a couple times, write your book, but then all of a sudden, I think it was three years ago, she said, Heidi, write your book. And it was just like a lightning bolt to my heart. It was like, now I need to write my book. Mm. And I also, um, at the time had been watching, um, these sermons about how, if you want to grow your influence, you need to serve and you need to go lower. Mm -hmm. Um, and because my students hopefully all learn, um, mental health as well as music in, in my classes, that's 38 a year that I'm influencing. And I just want that influence to be greater. Like how many young musicians are dealing with insecurity and yeah. and fear of failure and all these things that we deal with as creatives, right? Um, so I started writing my book. So yeah, it's, 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 I'm really excited. It goes through about 20 different mental obstacles and weaves in um, spiritual concepts, but in secular language, I really want it to be released into the marketplace. I've also written it. Um, I've also written it for all creatives. So I've interviewed actually um, your uh, daughter-in-law. I've interviewed painters, um, dancers, uh, not our authors, I have an author of a trilogy who, you know, how do how do you access creativity? What blocks creativity? All these kinds of things are discussed in the book. Um, it's kind of like a manual, I guess, for, for mental health, for creatives. So it doesn't deal with any mental illness. It doesn't deal with like clinical stuff. It deals with just the things that creatives face, especially young creatives on a on a daily basis. And it's got all these beautiful stories from my students. Almost every single, including uh, your granddaughter, yes. almost every single one of my students has written a Pete, like a, a paragraph about their personal journey through one of the obstacles. Yeah. And I think, you know, like, like this kind of thing is very important to be, um, to be written, but also to be handed to students, to be handed to musicians, but also to the families of musicians or creatives. Because it's one thing to put your child in a lesson. It's one thing to notice that this is their gifting, the way, you know, they're, they're bent, if you will. But it's another thing to really understand it and to make space for it and not crush their spirit in it, but to allow them to thrive and to come out in the way that God, have, God intended them to. And there are so many hindrances, aren't there? There's Ugh. roadblock even, after roadblock. Even just rejection. Like if you're in the arts at some point, you're going to get rejected and you have to be so strong. I actually, in my book, talk about, um, have you ever read the book from spiritual slavery to spiritual sun, um, sonship by Jack Frost? Probably. <laughs> well, in that book, he talks about this iceberg analogy where yeah. an iceberg is 10% above the water and 90% underneath. And so I tell my students that if your identity is in that part that's seen by everyone, right? You're in your gifting. If your whole sense of self-worth is only in your gift, when you suck at it, which you're going to suck at it sometimes, you're not always going to, it's not going to go well all the time. Um, so when, when that storm hits, your, your self-esteem goes with it. So your, your, your sense of self-worth has to be below the surface. So I'm trying to just translate it all for these, for these um, students who are not from the Christian environment. 
And I know that you've had to learn some of these things just to bring it to a personal level, not to pry, but you've had to walk through these things as well. Oh. Every single one has been a, a wrestle and uh, it's life, or, you know, and, and victory in these areas and understanding wasn't just handed to you on a silver platter. Uh, no, no, I haven't been through all of them. Um, a lot of them, some of them have just been from teaching students and saying like, whoa, what is this? Yeah. What is this? And how do I get this student past this? I've had a couple students that want to be globally famous and who are planning their tours, but who are not writing their songs. And so like, that's not something I've never done, but it's still an obstacle. Like you're living 20 years in the future instead of actually taking your very first step. So what's hindering that first step, right? Fear usually. <laughs> yeah, it's always fear. That's the elephant in every single room, mm. at least trying to get into the room and make a lot of noise. And sometimes yep. it's just the noise that stops you in your track. Okay, so Heidi, when do you think, how much longer do we have to wait? Well, that depends on how my beautiful and beloved pre-readers um, read it. Because I just want, I want people in different fields to give it a read just to make sure because it's going out into the, you know, it's like, even yeah. that's scary for me because it's like, what if I made a mistake somewhere in it? Yikes. Um, so I'm hoping, I really want it to be published by, by end of 2022. I, I really feel this year. Okay. Well, we're going to believe God with you for that. And um I think that there's this year, there's going to be birthing of a lot of things, actually. It's just that I see things coming down slides. If I close my eyes to pray, I see things coming down slides or I see things coming out of tunnels. Wow. And it's, I, I feel that kind of acceleration in, in the spiritual realm. And it's, it's not going to be always the things that we think, you know, this traditional churchy kind of thing. God is moving greatly outside of, of, um, the four walls of the church now, you know, long ago, it's remember for a while it was um, God has left the four walls of the church or something like that, you know, he's <laughs> outside, but now there's traction to that. And it's, it's not a surprise. And we're actually welcoming it and looking at it and having conversations about how do we do this in the marketplace? How do we live as believers? And how do we live a prophetic life, which is a life that speaks the word of God to uh, an environment or into a culture which doesn't isn't even in many cases interested in yeah. God, and yet you know, and and you're an example of that. Hmm. Um, did you find it hard, or do you ever find it hard, or is it that you found your place and you found your lane, and you feel good in it? Ah, uh, you know, I I can feel a shift coming for me. Mm -hmm. I can't see it yet. I think when this book is out, there will be a shift. Mm -hmm. Um, cause right now I'm one-to-one. -one, so mm -hmm. my labor is very, like, it's very intensive. It's one-to-one -one and it's on zoom. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd love it for it to be one to many eventually, just so that there can yeah. be greater influence. So I could see myself moving into speaking in the secular, um, world about mental health for young artists. I'd love to do that. Okay. All those radio station people that are listening. <laughs> yeah. TV stations. Oh, I've got plans. I have a whole plan, but my book has to come first. It like the book has to be the first thing that comes out and then I'm going to start a vodcast. Yeah. The book um, will open doors for you, Heidi. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm excited. So let's talk a little bit about worship because you've been a worshiper mm. in one way or another for as long as I have known you. Even well, in those days where you were, uh, uh, you know, still locked into your denominational thing, like music and singing to God, that's part of who you are. Yep. I am. Um, well, putting like the first 20 years aside, um, I guess my, the, the two people who really influenced me in worship um, were Julie Meyer and Joanne McFadder, um, who are dear friends of mine. I just loved what they carried. I would think some people are I know like really anointed worship leaders who are, who love singing um, the same old hymns. It actually like brings them such peace and they, and their voices just carry the wind of the spirit on it. I think the way I am made is the spontaneous. Um, I'm like, for me to sing for two hours of my own song, that's okay. I can do that. Um, for me to live in someone else's song is a little bit harder because it's someone else's heart. It's not necessarily mine. 
Um, so I think different worship leaders have different, I think different worship leaders have different callings and anointings um, that can be celebrated, right? We're all different people and we all play different parts. Um, so I know that that's my favorite thing uh, to do. In fact, in my 20s, um, I used to, my friend and I led an evening, we used to call it God Night, really genius title. <laughs> but we we would meet on Friday nights and we would just worship spontaneously the whole evening and flow with the Holy Spirit. And those were it was every Friday night and those were some of the best times. Just what God would just show up. You know, we would end up rapping like these white girls rapping um <laughs> raps of praise to the Lord that were, you know, we have some of them on uh <laughs> recorded and they're very cringy but the Lord loved them. <laughs> So that, that I think that plus the influence of those two women who also just carry this prophetic gifting in worship really influenced who I was and who I became. Um, still my favorite thing in church is to host the spontaneous moments. So in, in my church before the pandemic, I would sit at the piano and play along. Um, and then whenever there was a spontaneous moment, I would sort of take over and host that moment. That's, that's fun for me. Yeah. I think that when it comes to worship, that's what the whole point is, is to allow what's deeply inside of us or deep inside of us that comes out of our friendship with God and our love relationship with God uh, to come out, right? It's not mm -hmm. necessarily just joining in everyone's song. There's something unique to you and it's actually having the maturity and the ability to find out what that is. I know you you talked about um, the difference between worshiping as an orphan and worshiping oh, yeah. as a son or a daughter. Boy, do I feel strongly about that. If I had a soapbox for worship leaders, it would probably be that, that specific. Can I, can I say what I think about it? Yes, you may. Okay. Um, so in this, in, in, in my music studio, I have um, five, I guess, criteria that I would give my students that make up a good artist. Um, and an artist's goal, this is outside of Christian Christianity for the moment, an artist's goal is to move the heart of their audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, someone that's singing for themselves, is, is their goal is to be impressive. Yeah. And that's really different from an artist. And so with my students, we talk about authenticity, being 100% comfortable in your own skin, not trying to be anyone else, not trying to look like anyone else. Um, to me, that's number one. I, I have such a hard time engaging with a singer who's trying. Um, it just, yeah, it, it, it's not authentic. Um, and then skill is a part of it, right? Because, well, it is. <laughs> and then, um, and for me, another big one is being present in your lyrics. And this is one that I have failed at uh, in, in the past, because as worship leaders, we sing the same lyrics over and over again, especially in this charismatic culture where it's, it's, it's very repetitive. And so it's easy, if we're honest, um, it's easy to be thinking about what you're going to do after or or something else or like what the Holy Spirit's doing in the room and, and completely dissociate from the song you're singing. Yeah. Like, instead of being actually present in every lyric as it goes out. Um, it's a lot more work to sing present than yeah. it is to... Um, yeah, I can connect with, yeah, there's, I think there's many layers. I can connect with the Lord and dissociate from the song, but I think there's something beautiful when you can do both. Um, be connected with Holy Spirit, but still be in what you're singing as well. Uh, and then I also think having authentic emotion engaged um, when you sing is really important. Um, I, I grew up singing with no emotion. I literally had all my emotion shut off until until that moment in my life. And I think... I think never singing anything that you don't have ocean attached to is my sort of mantra now. And then, and then, yeah, having it, does that make sense? I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but those yeah, are the no. things that I would, when I, when I started thinking about worship leading and I was sitting in a citywide Winnipeg uh, meeting and there were two worship leaders uh, up at the front, a guy and a girl. And whenever the guy sang, I was instantly brought into the throne room and instantly brought into God's presence. And whenever the girl sang, I was distracted and thinking about groceries. And and I was like, because I'm a, I really like to understand things, especially in the realm of music. I'm like, God, like, what is the difference? Because it was really they kept switching and it was so noticeable in, out, 
in, out. And I was like, what is the difference? And the Lord said to me that everything I was teaching my students in the secular realm was actually applicable here. Yes, exactly. And I was like, I was sat there just going, what? Wow. So, and then, and then in addition, now I would add to that for worship leaders, um, it would be leading from a place of, of sonship or leading from a place of orphanship. Um, that will really affect the room, in my opinion, as well. So sonship means you're leading worship from the place of, and to me, it almost feels like I'm putting it on. Um, even if I'm in my personal life, not in that place, if I'm going to lead worship, I will put on a place of thankful sonship before, before leading. Cause it totally affects the room. Yeah. And, and what I mean by that would be, I am fully loved and accepted right now to lead worship from that place fills the room with something different than God, where are you? Please come in the room. We want you so bad. We, you know, that carries something totally different. And I can walk into worship and feel which one it is, right? Because to me, the one of like, please come in the room. And like, sorry if that's anyone listening. To me, that one feels really heavy. Yeah. It feels like, like labor. Um, as opposed to like walking into the fact that God is in the room, God lives in me, God um, wants intimate friendship with me. Yeah. Does that make sense? It totally does. And I've heard some of the things that you've done where you've lived out those principles, both in your, in your, the secular in quotations m music that you do, if there is such a thing. And, huh. in, and when you, like, I've heard you do some Psalms and different things like that. Like and those same, uh, you can you can sense those same principles working themselves out in your life in that music because you just can, can get pulled into into the music and then it does a work in you and and that's a completely different thing than let's all be happy clappy and you know like like that that inauthentic or what has become inauthentic in many cases. I think sometimes things have started off well. But, I agree with that. But, started off well. Yeah. But but eventually they just got overplayed and or, and overused or picked up by the wrong people. Songs that were never intended for that particular group of people. You know, we we tend to latch ourselves onto things that are trending and you know look or sound a certain way. But I think COVID actually, God bless covid in the sense that there has been so many freedoms it's brought into our lives and so many wisdom moments and and forced us to re-examine many of our practices um you know i think that has been a gift to us in that way you know like you can look back and even with all the difficulty and all the terrible hard things that have gone on there are things mm -hmm. to give thanks for and this i think is one of them yeah i would agree Wow. For me, for me, though, this whole last three years has been a very inward, <laughs> inward journey that I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for, actually. Yeah. Tell us a little bit what you've learned from, um, you had another lady you mentioned, Joanne McFadder. Oh, my gosh. I am so they're, privileged. They're, they're different, you know, Julie and Joanne. So what have you learned from, what did you learn from her as a mentor? Well, it was originally the album that has struck me and is one of the only Christian albums. Ooh, I shouldn't have said that I'm talking about worship. No, you can say what you want. We'll, we'll touch on that later. But I don't have a lot of, because um, for me, music is a lot of learning. And mm -hmm. I hear God through melody and through chord progressions. So uh, I often pick what I listen to very carefully. And it's the things I listen to are designed to take me higher often as a musician. Yeah. Um, and I can usually worship through whatever it is, like, yeah, I can I I can engage God. Wait, let's leave that for later. I'm getting confused. I'm confusing myself, everyone. Hello. <laughs> what was the question again? I completely what, went what off on her. Things have you learned from Joanne McFadden? Oh, oh yes. Okay. Well, uh, man, the the album that has resonated. Oh yes, this is where I was going. Yeah. Um, with me is their chosen album that you can get on iTunes, okay. and um. And it's Steve Swanson, um, I think another Steve, Julie Meyer, and Joanne McFadder. And that album, I have listened to that over and over and over again. And I just do not get tired of it. Just there, just hearing there, it's a whole evening of prophetic, spontaneous worship. Um, 
I find they carry different things. Like Joanne is like deep in the prophetic. Julie is like breakthrough, but she's also prophetic. So they, they're, they're really just different people, um, both beautiful. And I think I'm a bit of both. I'm, I'm not as, yeah, I have an element of like breakthrough, but I also have an element of prophetic. Um, but I don't think I'm as deep in either, either things as those beautiful women are. Well, those but I, I try not to think about that because again, that's comparison. The only thing that I can is. do is bring me to the table and offer it to you, to the Lord and to you, right? It is interesting though. I think it's wonderful that you've had, oh, the sun is coming up. I think it's wonderful that you have had the experience to know these kind of women in your life. And I think some of what you're talking about actually comes with age. <laughs> and I remember... Here's just an example of why I believe that so strongly. I was in California at a, a prophet's conference and there was a, a young, wonderful worship group, you know, all young and trendy and very, very good and popular. And um, and they led worship beautifully and we all joined in and, and, and experienced the presence of God and worshiped him. And, and then... Um, there was one session and Chris Ballatin's wife, um, I can't think of her name right, Kathy, I think, uh, got up to lead worship by herself. And she was an older woman in the sense that if you put the two side by side, you could tell one had more wrinkles <laughs> than the other. But she was older and she just opened her mouth and began to sing out of her relationship with God. And my goodness, what a difference. Yep. And it's huge. I and I thought, oh, you know, yeah. And so that that really, when when you say that you got to to learn from these women, part of it is you got to drink from that deep well that's been developed out of their relationship with God that has developed over years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think even that, like the Lord, the Lord actually just recently, well, before, maybe two years ago. Um, really um taught me that in an evening at a boney m concert okay uh, in winnipeg i went to actually hear uh one of my favorite technical singers who was opening for boney m in winnipeg yeah and and so i was there and i ran her merch table and fangirled horribly because you know it's one of my favorite singers and here i am meeting them and all that and i'm a horrible for fangirling uh <laughs> this these are both secular and um and I had prepared to leave actually after after her part was done. And and it was so interesting because I was sitting in the audience watching my one of my favorite technical singers win Winnipeg. She did. Her skill was it's out of this world. She's probably one of the best singers in North America. And she won the room on her skill alone. Like just everyone was with her, everyone was impressed by her. Um, you could just feel that admiration and like, wow. And then, and then, so I was saying goodbye to them in the, in the hallway and Boney M had come on and started to sing and, um, and the Lord arrested me and said, no, you cannot leave. And I sat, I stood there in the hallway by myself going, is this the Holy Spirit or is this, what is this? I, it's late. I want to go home. I have to drive somewhere tonight. Yeah. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit was like, do not leave. Um, and so I was like, well, fine, I will go in for five minutes, uh, and see what the Lord has for me there. I walk in and there's, I forget how old she is. She's probably mid sixties, the lead singer now. Um, but I walk in, as soon as I walk in, she stops the, the set and starts talking about God. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Thank you, Lord, that I got to hear someone speak about Jesus. You know, if I had left, I would have missed this. Mm -hmm. And then within five minutes of singing, she had turned the room to feel like Christmas morning with your family. Like, yeah. like the, and I suddenly loved, and I'm an introvert. I suddenly loved everyone in the room. And I would have gone up and kissed that lady on the cheek, like, and I didn't know her at all. And 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 her voice, in comparison to my favorite technical singer, her voice maybe only had eight notes to it, and it was scratchy mm -hmm. and older sounding. And yeah. and I was like, wow, skill isn't everything. It's not just about how good you are, because the room felt it, it was incredible to walk in. And then she sang a song with my name in it that I had been trying to track down since I was a child where it came from. So I was like, thank you, Holy Spirit, that, you know, that you're my teacher and that, you know, that you care about these little things. So that was a big moment that skill isn't everything. 
sometimes it's it's what you carry. It's 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 your depth th with the yeah. Lord that matters. Yeah. I remember seeing that same kind of thing in the prophetic world one time. I was watching a VHS tape. If you can, well, you can't remember that. I, I can too. <laughs> a VHS tape when we lived up in Lynn Lake, Manitoba at the end of the world. And and um, it was of Kenneth Hagen. And he had a young prophetess up on the stage. And she was beginning to give a word out. And then... Um, she she got to a certain point and then that was it and Kenneth Hagen looked out onto the audience and and saw this older lady and called her up to the front so she came with her stick and and she it was like she stepped into the point where the younger one finished off and then she was able to bring the rest of the word and I just saw the beauty um of of what each one carried but also how you need both as well you know, so when we say um, that the, you know, there's the the older lady, you know, with her scratchy voice and and the, its limitations and all that kind of stuff, she just took what she was carrying inside and presented it as an offering, and and so did the young technical person, and probably the technical singer will one day be that person with this old scratchy. I hope so. I hope. Well, I hope not the scratchy voice, but. <laughs> to me that to me that just because I had placed skill as as something that was of highest level priority, you know, be skilled in your craft. Just to see this lady who maybe had less of a range and a more worn out sound with just come out and 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 create something that I couldn't even imagine. Like the atmosphere difference was incredible. And so for me, that's always a reminder. It's like skill isn't everything, Heidi. Like how about <laughs> How about you connect with Holy Spirit? How about you're present in your lyrics? How about you love your audience and your audience, both audiences? Yeah. Right? When you lead worship, although I'm not leading worship at the moment. But yeah, to me, that's just a really big reminder. Well, I can just say that I know about male singers and I do have a preference for older ones with scratchy, growly voices. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what I have to say about that little section that we've been talking about. Someone's saying here, I'm keenly interested in reading your book, Heidi, for God's glory. So Ooh. be encouraged, be encouraged. And she thank you, Relinda. Music is a gift that we can give back to God over and over again for his delight and pleasure. Those are both really good statements. And, and I think it's important that that all of us hear what Heidi's talking about today. Talk a little bit. I know we're going back and forth and in and out of things. We're, you, we are. I'm sorry. It's, no, no. I it's difficult to tell me, tell me, you mentioned the word skill. Just talk a little bit because that's important to me too in the area of the prophetic. The, the fact that you have to discipline yourself and learn something well. So talk about the ah, skill. Okay. I think there's a balance to be struck when it comes to skill. I mm -hmm. think if skill, for me, skill was becoming the main thing for a while, mm -hmm. um, which threw me off course. But then I would actually say sometimes it's the other way around. I think as a Christian musician, becoming skilled in, in, in I think it'll, ah. So I would equate it to painting in the sense that if you paint with just red and white, mm -hmm. it could be very beautiful. But the more colors, um, you can grab the greater the potential for your creativity. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the same way, um, a lot of musicians learn three note chords and that's it. That's sort of, you're good enough to kind of play on a worship team if you learn three note chords, you know, a couple keys, you know, maybe the key of C, the key of F, the key of G. And then, and you can r really write an album based on that with four chord songs and that's fine. But I feel like that's the current trend right now is to write really simple songs and i just think i i think there's room to um to to grow in our creativity as as believers um so i would challenge christian musicians to learn four note chords secondary dominance you know tritone substitutions learn your sevens and nines and elevens like so that when you're expressing yourself you have more color to play with yeah and and you are giving yourself yeah a much bigger palette aren't you with yep. much more opportunities to say things or release things that you're thinking about even that come out when you yep. say play keys or whatever instrument it is you're happening, happen and, to use. And for me, I actually had to leave the 
don't kick me off the broadcast. But I had to leave the realm of Christian music to learn that, actually. Oh, There's, okay. yeah. Explain that, please. Um, well, just, uh, I, mm, I don't know that much. I would say like black gospel has a lot of like four note chords and really exciting chords. Mm -hmm. Um, but the mainstream radio Christian music right now, at least, um, is a little bit more pop and it has a certain yeah. sound to it right now. Yeah. And it's chord structure. It's like what it's built on is, is a little bit more simple, um, so in order, like I had never, I remember taking a couple lessons with Steve Swanson, who is from that album. I'm so blessed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I paid to have some Zoom coaching with him. And he was like, Heidi, you sound like a classical player. And I was like, what? No, I don't. He's like, where are your sevens? Where are your nines? Where's your blue scales? Like, do you even know what a blue scale is? And I had no idea what a blue scale is. Wow. And so he, he diagnosed about, you know, six or seven things that I was missing as a piano player. And that even just that diagnosis allowed me to suddenly run after, okay, I'm going to learn all 12 blues scales. What are they? You know, one flat, three, four, sharp, four, five, flat, seven, eight, you know, wow, that's a new concept. When do I use that? Um, even just, e even understanding the modes, um, just, there are so many things that, that I think we can grow in, in skill. But again, if it gets too much and that becomes your main focus, then it can, then it can also be a hindrance. But so I think there is a balance to, to be had. But wow. I'm I'm really grateful, I think, for that growth. I think I tell my students that um, the chords are like vegetables. I said, who is the happier person? The person who only eats cucumbers on their sub or the person who put likes all vegetables? And they are like, well, the person who likes all vegetables. And it's because wherever you go, you're going to be served other things other than cucumbers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you can appreciate all the vegetables out there, you'll probably be a happier person when you're eating at someone else's house. And so I say in, in music, it's the same thing. The more different genres and chords and, and um, styles you can learn to appreciate, you'll, you'll just, you'll see God everywhere in these magical little places. Like I can hear God in a blues band and just go, wow, God, that's so cool. Mm. Wow. I think that, um, there's probably 101 instruments that you can play or at least, ha -ha. Ex at least experiment with what's your favorite? Where do you find yourself being the most natural and feeling at home? Because obviously that's where you're going to be able to express yourself the best. That's true. Yep. Although I was speaking with Ray Hughes again, what another honor. He gave me an interview for my book. He has written over a thousand songs. He's a songwriter from the United yeah. States, just yeah. a really cool guy. Yeah. And he said, actually, when you songwrite, it's better to first write it on an instrument that you're maybe not as comfortable with so that your heart's cry can come out, which blew my mind because I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah. I but that's what, that. that's what he said. Um, and he also is quoted as saying, music shouldn't uh, sound like music. It should sound like something that fell out of your mind and heart and made your life make sense. And I was like, wow, that's that's profound. Um, for me, I'm a little bit different because I want to move into production, maybe even film scoring at some point. Yeah. So um, for me, the Lord has said the good is the enemy of the great. So I used to play cello. I used to play the harp. And those are my goods. And in order for me to be great at them, it would, it would take away um, from where I'm called to be. So I actually sold my cello and sold oh, my harp. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I did because it would take 10,000 hours for me to be where I want to be with the cello. Yeah. Um, so instead I'm moving towards music production. You know, this just fits in with everything else that God is speaking to prophetically to, to different people in different parts of the world about finding our lane and not trying to be a jack of all trades, you know, like, like you, you, you're good at a whole bunch of things, but you're not a master or, you know, good, really, really good at one. And so that sort of fits into that kind of idea. And it also makes, makes you someone who can make room for the next person, you know, instead of saying, well, I can do that. I can do that. And, <laughs> you know, trying to spread yourself out into every single lane, which I oh, think I, is really sad. <laughs> I, I think I'm probably still spread a little too thin in that when I make music, I play everything myself currently. And um, eventually that won't be the case, but, but I'm better than I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi, it's been really good as, as your friend, just watching your journey. And we've done some fun things together, going to midnight mass and and different places and and yeah and i'm looking and, forward to being able to do lots of those things again yes 
when you're wearing your cat free clothes. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't get a cat for 10 years because of you because you were in, and then finally you were in England and I'm like well she's been in England for a long time and it was the Never pandemic back. <laughs> I know and then I get a cat and what happens you come back and I know I always um, laugh and say that if people it's it's like a Rebecca repellent is get a cat because mm -hmm. then you won't find me in your house <laughs> I'll just come to your house and wear some of your old clothes yeah that's fine it was quite interesting in england because the the number so many people have cats there and the you know so the the number of houses i could go visiting in was <laughs> would become less and less and less mm. <laughs> but anyway that's how it is heidi thank you so much for sharing your life with us i'm being blinded by the light here i don't know if blinded that's by the light yeah, does anyone have any questions while we're here that's before we fine. like yeah. leave like here i'll take go. some q a i think my my cat is listening right over here yes let's have some questions type them in the comments um we'll just wait for a few minutes is yeah. there anything else any question like say while they are thinking of their questions to write out sure any questions about songwriting or or problems that you're experiencing in your music even yeah. technically i might have something of value to give away that's also something i've appreciated um big yes helps us know what to say no to okay no that's not a, a question <laughs> that's just a comment one thing I've appreciated is how you take your students and you train them in writing their own songs. Yeah. From a very young age. Okay, here's something. How did you know what to lay down and how did you know what to keep hold of? Um, for me, I would say like every decision I make, it's almost like I'll look either way. And, and for me, I feel the Lord mostly in my stomach. I know that sounds really funny. Um, and so often every decision I make, there'll be either peace or there'll be tension. Um, so so that's that's the first thing I would say is just like hearing the Lord for yourself really helps because there'll be peace with something and there'll be not peace with something else. Uh, for me, because where I want to head is having my own music. I want to have an album out eventually of my own music. I want to do children's music, have a Christmas children's album out. Um, so for me, cello... It, when I can just push my piano and turn it into a cello. Yeah. Um, for me, that was part of the reason I let go of those. I, also, my skill was really low in them. I, I had tremendous joy in playing my harp. It had wood in it from Finland, but, oh, but I was not excellent at it. And so in order for me to become excellent, I would have, I would have to say no to all the instruments that I know I'm called to be on. Like the piano is probably my heart instrument as well as singing. Yeah. That's the one that I can like really engage Holy Spirit on. Whereas bass, I love playing the bass, but I've got to keep my eyes open because if I close my eyes, there's going to be a bloop that happens in the in the morning service. So it it, it often looks like this when I play the bass, <laughs> so that I don't botch it. But I still I yeah. So I'd say like the instrument you engage the Lord on, um, like dig into that one. Okay. All right. If that makes sense, that would be my. That's sort of that's what I did anyways. Like to me, the two that I let go of were were not on the same path that I the rest of me was on. Yeah, I so did play. Yeah, go ahead. What you're saying is you examined your life, and and you just had to list the pros and cons kind of thing, and then make a wise decision. There you go. You said it better. <laughs> no, I didn't. I'm just condensing it. <laughs> But as far as songwriting, I mean, I think the thing that I've given away to my students that really, if you're a songwriter or you want to write songs, um, is that we have sort of two parts of us. We have creator and we have, well, there's a lot of parts of us, but in songwriting, I would call them creator and critic. Yeah. And both are valuable, but you don't want to have both of them operating at the same time. Because uh -huh. what happens then is you have this creative moment and then critic goes, is this really good? Do you like this? Do you think this person over there will like it? And then it's like, well, let's throw that idea out and start. And, and, and so they're almost counteracting one another when you write a song. Yeah. So you actually want to have critic all the way silenced when you write. And you mm. want to have you you want to be in a place that's peaceful and flowy. I would describe creativity like a river. And to me, I would actually describe it like Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's how that's how I would 
describe it to the Christian community, to, to my students, I would describe it as a river that you can step in. And yeah. when you're in it, you don't want to leave. So I tell them yeah. to, when they're, when they're, um, when they're writing their songs to not leave until everything has been written. Cause the next day to get back into that same flow that you were in the day before is really hard. It's easier just to stay in that flow and finish the song in that moment. And then when you've written everything and everything's done and you've written it out of yourself only, not to please this person or so that this person thinks you're cool or so that this church will give you more respect. Yeah. Um, uh, when you've written everything, then critic can come out to play and go, okay, let's, how can we make this better? Is this, yeah. you know, is this biblically sound if it's a worship song, you know? You know what? And there, I think that we're going to stop there, but that is an incredible example of how you take the things of the spirit and you use them in the marketplace, like almost in a subversive manner, you know, because in, the, in in a churchy way, you yeah, the river of God and let's jump in and go with the flow and blah, 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 which is all good. But the way you describe it to your in your secular job, um, it's the same. It's just different language. And you're actually interpreting the things of God in the marketplace and making them valuable to people and they can begin to live by the principles of the kingdom without even realizing it. And when they do that, they're inviting God to step into their lives. Oh, here's something. One more question and then we'll go. Heidi, it says um, here, I'll put it up on the screen. Perhaps a little personal, Heidi, how do you sing in the spirit? Or do, do you sing in the spirit? Or do you sing in the spirit? So I yeah. thought you said how. Okay. Do I, you sing in the spirit? For me, singing in the spirit can mean many things. It can mean singing in tongues, for mm -hmm. sure, um, which I'll do. It can mean spontaneously playing on the piano. Mm -hmm. um, to me, singing in the spirit can even mean like through dance. I'm not the best dancer on the planet, um, but but every week I swim in an outdoor pool and it has Bluetooth. So I put music on and... It doesn't look pretty under, but no one sees it. And and it is my worship unto the Lord. So I, I think all of those three to me feel like singing in the spirit. Yeah. It's but that I you couldn't necessarily biblically back that up. I mean, because I'm not singing, I'm dancing. But well, you know what I think it's obedience and and um yeah, that there's there are different ways of just of, of singing in the spirit, but also praying in the spirit as well. And so we need to have hearts that are open, hearts that are hungry, and we need to be people who are willing to take what we have and to bring it to the world around us because they're just, just waiting to know God, even if they don't know it, <laughs> even if they're not aware, you know, even, so. even just something as simple as like, uh, like I, I teach my students to discern atmosphere yeah. um, and, and they don't, they're, they're not christians but i'm like that you were at neutral before you listened to the song where did it take you emotionally so yeah. that they're they're learning to become i i like to call it the gandalf i give a picture of like you know gandalf in the lord of the rings you shall not pass yeah um over their own i call it eye gate and ear gate it's like what are you letting in if you're a teenager struggling with depression what are you letting in that either you know are you letting in something that can help lift that or is it actually pulling it down further right so yeah, even discerning, that's something I love teaching them is discerning the atmosphere of what they're bringing in and how it affects them. Because most of them don't even know that what you listen to can change your emotions like that. <laughs> no kidding. And right there is why I am so thrilled that my grandchildren <laughs> are learning from Miss Heidi. Heidi, thank you so much. We've been chatting for an hour. And uh, I just want to thank you for sharing your life with us, your experience, your just your wisdom and your passion for the things that, that you do. It's been fantastic. Thank you. You are so welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for being with us. I'll be back next Wednesday with another guest. God bless you all until then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.